In today's video, we have a lot to cover, and we're taking a look at the offseason. We're looking at the Maple Leafs and Mitch Marner negotiation. Are they going to be able to keep Marner? Are they going to have to consider making a move and changing up the uh, the dynamic of that team? We'll take a look at that scenario. Uh, lots of thoughts from the 32 Thoughts podcast discussing that scenario. Ryan Hartman's been suspended for three games. We also have several other updates as well, including some updates on some key prospects that might be signing, as well as some more playing in the NCAA Frozen Four. Could we see coaching changes coming? coming up in the offseason for the Red Wings and the St. Louis Blues. We'll discuss those possibilities and a whole lot more coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have a lot to cover in today's video. Let's kick things off with the uh, fairly recent news here that Ryan Hartman of the Minnesota Wild has been handed a three-game suspension from the Department of NHL player safety now in yesterday's video we talked about the fact he was going to be having a hearing or actually it might have been two days ago um that we talked about that because the hearing was actually announced uh on uh sunday that it was going to be taking place today and now we know the result uh so essentially on saturday uh the minnesota wild played the vegas golden knights as we know uh there was a, a case where it went to overtime minnesota once again for the second time this year pulled the goaltender trying to get an advantage in ot and get the extra point uh it backfired on them they lost, and of course, when you lose with the goalie out in overtime, you get zero points. So it completely, um, you know, turned into a catastrophe in that sense. But there was apparently a missed call that the Wild were unhappy about. They were hoping to get a penalty call against Vegas that they thought was fair and justified. The refs missed it, did not call it. So once the game was over, Ryan Hartman started to go down the tunnel, came back threw a stick on the ice uh, in the direction of the officials. He was also, you know, berating the officials using some, uh, you know, probably not great language at them. Um, and we knew that that was likely going to result in a suspension. So actually throwing a stick after the game was over in the direction of officials, well, that's pretty much a given that you're going to get something. I know some people thought three games might be a little bit harsh, but the main thing here is Hartman himself did admit to player safety that it was unprofessional and acceptable behavior and that he knew wouldn't be tolerated. And the big thing here is player safety has deemed him a repeat offender. Ryan Hartman has a long, long list of suspensions and fines in the past few years. So because of his repeat offender status, that's why it ended up being more. I think overall in the course of his career, Ryan Hartman will now have forfeited, I think, $136,000. It's a lot of money adding up, uh, but this is not unusual behavior from the wild forward. So Minnesota will be without Ryan Hartman for the next three games. Uh, Jeff Skinner is set to play game number 1,000 tonight for the Buffalo Sabres. Uh, so he's had a pretty solid career, pretty consistent in the goal scoring uh, category. I mean, he's had a few years where things were down, but for the most part, he's, you know, 30 to 40 goals quite often. He got started at a real young age, uh, went to the NHL immediately after being drafted. The only sad part about Skinner's career is he's uh, played the entire time between the Carolina Hurricanes and the Buffalo Sabres. And he's never seen a playoff game. I mean, he only played with the Hurricanes kind of before they started getting good uh, and becoming more of a contender. In the last uh, number of years with the Sabres, they haven't been a playoff team at all during his tenure there. So, a thousand games with no playoffs. I mean, I've seen a few other cases like that, but it's it's not a very common feat and i'm sure it's a group of players that jeff skinner would rather not be a part of but we'd like to congratulate him for his uh, his successful career game 1000 is a big accomplishment if you think about how many players are active in the nhl now and have played in the nhl over the course of its history it's a small group that reached that special plateau uh, so hopefully he will get to see and experience playoffs before too long, before it's all said and done. Uh, we did get word as well the NHL playoffs will officially start on Saturday, April 20th. The final game is on the 18th. That's a quick turnaround. Obviously, getting it going on a Saturday night, I think, is a, is a good idea. Lots uh, to like about that. And Saturday night tends to be the NHL's biggest night for games and viewers and uh, ratings and that type of thing, which is good. I know uh, there is a factor from U.S. TV schedules as well. I'm not sure the exact details as to why, but I know that did play a factor in. Um, you know, obviously, that bumps up the last possible date that the playoffs can end, uh, which also will uh, allow a little bit extra time that uh, before, but based on the previous schedule, that uh, from the time of the season, it's over the Cups handed out, and then they move into the draft and free agency. There was only a short window there. They'll get a few extra days now. So Saturday, April 20th, mark your calendars. That is when the NHL 2024 Stanley Cup playoffs 
will begin. Uh, several other roster updates from around the league. Some of this is regarding prospects, some regarding injuries. Uh, the San Jose Sharks today confirmed that one of their top prospects, 2022 first rounder Philip Bystad, uh, he's coming over to North America, has been assigned to the American Hockey League. Now that his uh, season in Sweden and the SHL is over, he put up 17 points in 47 games over there. And uh, same goes for the Minnesota Wild, former first rounder Liam Ogren. His season in Europe's also over, and he's being assigned to the Iowa Wild. So we'll get to see, um, you know, at least in North America at the uh, AHL level, some of these top prospects coming over from Europe. So I'm not sure if they'll get a chance to be called up at all before the NHL season's over. But either way, at least they're uh, making the jump, which is the big step getting them into the NHL here. Um, eventually, the Philadelphia Flyers are expected to have Jamie Drysdale return tonight. So it's good to see his uh, injury is um, all healed up and ready to roll. Uh, in Boston as well, Pat Maroon was skating today at practice. I think that's one of the first times he skated, if not the first time. Still listed as week to week. He's still likely going to be out a little while. I think they're targeting a return date of around April the 13th by the sounds of things. Uh, he's likely only going to get to play you know, maybe two to three games at most before the regular season is over. Uh, in Seattle tonight, apparently Vince Dunn will be a game-time decision, but the great news here is that Shane Wright, who we talked about yesterday, who was called up, is going to get to play with some offensive players. He's not going to be in a bottom six role. He's going to be centering a line with Jaden Schwartz and Jordan Eberle. Uh, so it's good to see Wright getting an opportunity to succeed, get him in the right spots. I know when his limited NHL action before, I uh, quite often was in a different role, which I didn't really think was good and well suited for him. Uh, he's had a great season in the American Hockey League. It'd be a great opportunity to kind of get an idea um, where things are at in terms of his development. In Vegas, uh, Thomas Hurdle. Uh, was finally uh, practicing with the Golden Knights. Of course, he was acquired uh, at the deadline as one of the biggest moves and a surprise move. Uh, of course, he's yet to play because he's been out injured. Uh, again, just like Maroon, he's not necessarily super close. He wasn't a non-contact jersey, so he's still a little ways away, but at least good to see him back on the ice with the team. Uh, in New Jersey as well, they've assigned defenseman Santeri Hataka back to the American Hockey League. And then the Sharks also, besides uh, assigning Bystad to the AHL, they've recalled Jack Stadnika. So good to see him getting another opportunity in the NHL. Now, as I mentioned, we have some other updates around the league involving coaching, uh, but changes, potential, some prospects as well. Uh, let's start with a couple of updates on the St. Louis Blues. Uh, one, of course, one of their top prospects, if not the top prospect, Jimmy Snuggeroo, uh, his uh, college season has come to a close, and there's a lot of reports that the Blues are quite anxious to get him signed. Although, when it comes to burning a year off his contract, it sounds like that's not necessarily a big factor for him. I'm not saying it won't happen. It very well could. He could sign and get into games right away and burn a year. Uh, but it wouldn't necessarily be shocking if Snuggaroo uh, signed a contract that was effective next year. And maybe he did like an amateur tryout to go to the American Hockey League. Now, you think he might be a little bit above that because uh, he is a higher level prospect. That's, you know, typically they get to avoid some of those things. But um doesn't sound like what's being reported by Andy Strickland that that's something that's super important to he and his camp. So we'll see. But Snuggaroo's had a phenomenal season in college hockey. Uh, Terrific-looking prospect. Either way, it sounds like the odds of him signing in St. Louis are pretty good. And would be real curious to see him make the jump, whether it's end of this season or next. But Snuggaroo looks to be headed towards the NHL. And staying with the Blues, Andy Strickland also made comments regarding the coaching change that we might see. Uh, he was asked about uh, Drew Bannister and the interim uh, head coach, if he was going to have the interim tag removed and be named the uh, full-time permanent head coach of the Blues in the offseason or how things are likely going to play out. And his response was that he thinks Doug Armstrong and the Blues are going to talk to other candidates. It's I guess it's remotely possible Bannister stays, but he, he said he thinks that they're more likely to go in a different direction. So I'm not sure that Bannister is going to be sticking around. So um, we will see. If the Blues are in the hunt for a new head coach uh, in the not too distant future, I'm sure if they are going to move on, I would hope that they had a decision kind of made and that they don't leave things linger too long after the regular season's over. Uh, in Detroit, another update there, considering a possible coaching change. There's uh, reports out of Detroit media suggesting that if the Red Wings don't make the playoffs, and right now they're far from a lock, uh, they do have a chance, they're in the mix, 
But they're you know they're kind of up against it, mixing with a few other teams there, battling for those last couple of spots. Really, it's kind of down to one because Wildcard One's kind of been run away with right now by Tampa. So you're gonna kind of like the Flyers, uh, the Capitals are kind of and they recently switched spots. But you know then the Red Wings, Islanders are all kind of in that battle for that last spot. Uh, the odds I think are against Detroit, but it's still. Very much possible if they play really well down the stretch that they can possibly get in. But where the odds are against them, apparently there is word that the organization is considering a coaching change from Derek Lalonde. Um, now, of course, there's been a lot of rumblings, and we'll have to see if there's anything to this. But with former Red Wings legend Sergei Fedorov recently kind of becoming a, a free agent coach, if you want to call it that, uh, his time in the KHL, he's been the head coach of CSKA Moscow. And he has won a couple of championships. He's done a really good job there. And they announced just a few days ago that it's time for a change and he's not going to be returning. He's done there as coach. So um, they didn't really indicate the reasons why. I assume that's a mutually agreed upon decision that why wouldn't they want him back if he wanted to be there? Maybe he wants to go for other opportunities. Uh, It's a return to the NHL, something that's maybe coming. I mean, obviously because of you know the two pieces of news being kind of talked about around similar time it's got people wondering and suggesting if he could be the guy if they do make a move that's sort of be a real curious decision there's been some uh, other reports as well that if they do go with the um another coach that another coach that they're interested to talk to would be craig baruby uh who's popping up on a lot of names uh for teams looking for coaches in the offseason so again he's gonna have uh, lots of opportunities. I think Ruby probably going to be able to call a shot and kind of pick where he wants to go because I think there's going to be lots of teams that are interested in offering him a job. Now, as I mentioned as well, uh, college hockey continues to be highly entertaining right now. Uh, the NCAA Frozen Four will kick off on April 11th. We've seen some crazy games here in the last few days over the Easter weekend. Um, Boston College, Boston University, the University of Denver, and Michigan all heading for the Frozen Four. Uh, top college UFA, Colin Graff, getting a lot of attention as well now that his season is over with Quinn Pinniak. Um Hard to say where he ends up, but he's a center and a winger. He can play both positions. 21 years old, um, had a solid campaign, uh, 49 points in 34 games. I've seen Frank Sarah Valley report that he feels that there's a lot of teams interested, but that, uh, he did say he thought Boston might be a front runner. I've seen other Boston media suggest that that's far from a slam dunk, not necessarily the case. A lot of people think that because he's from the area, but again, I don't know. I mean, there's there's a lot of teams interested in Graf, and I'm sure he's going to want to probably analyze the situation to see where he can get, you know, a good chance to play. At the end of the day, you know, um, he wants to see a path to success and getting a chance at the NHL, not necessarily getting stuck in the minor. So we'll see where that goes. Um, one other piece of news as well. Uh, we know that the NHL was likely going to be parting ways with BioSteel, considering the, uh, the the company was struggling, went through bankruptcy, uh, and now it's been announced by Dave Pagnona tonight. I don't think the NHL has officially announced that, but it will be here very shortly that Body Armor is the new official hydration partner of the NHL, and that will be official and effective at the beginning of the 2024 NHL Stanley Cup playoffs. Uh, of course, like I said, the deal with BioSteel is uh, coming to an end. Uh, you will start to see when the playoffs begin the uh, the back of the NHL benches and stuff where you normally see a lot of the BioSteel uh, graphics and advertisements will all be removed and be replaced with Body Armor ones. Of course, Body Armor uh, was bought by Coca-Cola back, I think, four or five years ago and has kind of become a major player in the hydration market here. So no big surprise. Plus, we already knew that Connor McDavid had become a sponsor of theirs recently. So certainly makes sense. No surprise that this is happening at all. It's just a matter of time, in my opinion. This deal runs through to the 28 29 NHL season. Now, the other big topic I want to talk about is the future of Mitch Barner in Toronto. On 32 Thoughts uh, podcast that came out this morning with Elliot Friedman and Jeff Merrick, they talked about a variety of things, but one was the the Austin Matthews accomplishment of his uh, you know back back 60 goal seasons. But where Matthews ranks, and you know, does Matthews have a chance? to be the all-time greatest goal scorer. We know Alex Ovechkin is closing in on Gretzky's all-time record. Uh, We know that he has a 
still has a you know he had a, a not a great season but he's had a much better finish uh which has kind of got him caught back up so to speak so you know it's still fairly realistic that barring something crazy happening an injury or something that we can't predict that Ovechkin will beat Gretzky's record before his contract expires with the Capitals in the next one to two years. So how long will he hold that, though? If you take a look at where Matthews is at compared to where Ovechkin was at at the same age and same games, Matthews looks like he has a real potential if he can be like Ovi and hold up that production into his later years like Ovechkin has, that he's going to have a real good shot at breaking that record. And Ovechkin may not end up holding it for a super long period of time. Now, of course, it's going to take Matthews a while to get there. It's not like he's going to only have it for a year or something. It would be a while because uh, obviously he's well ahead of Matthews in terms of games played, age, etc. But there's a real possibility, like I said, if he stays healthy, can con- continue that big production into the later years, he's on pace to do it. So we might actually see this record broken multiple times you know, in a not that long of a time span. So considering how valuable that is and how it's Matthew's goal to be the all-time greatest, like they said that how hyper-competitive he is and that ultimately their job as a team in Toronto is to really make sure they continue to surround him with players who can get him the puck because they know if they can get him the puck, he's a really good chance to score with how dangerous he can be. So they talked about, obviously, Matthew's new contract. It wasn't super long, so obviously... You know, he's going to end up doing another deal with them at some point. If he does stay, um, it'll likely be a longer-term deal, and it's going to be an even bigger number next time if he continues to break his own records and continues to outperform himself in his old, uh, you know, his uh, season highs, etc. And what Merrick had to say was, you know, how does this affect Mitch Marner? As much as, you know, Marner's one of those guys who can be important to a guy like Matthews. He's one of those players who's a good playmaker. He can get him the puck, you know, Um and we like playing together. We know that between Marner, Matthews, Nylander, they kind of all want it to stay together. They're all going to be making big money. Nylander got his huge raise. Matthews got his. Marner's going to be the last one to go this time. Seeing as those two guys didn't take discounts, you don't think Marner's going to want to either. And what they were saying on the podcast was, you know the Leafs likely have a max that they're willing to go to. What that max is, we don't know exactly. But at the end of the day, you know, are they going to really break the bank here? Because, I mean, they still have Tavares for another year, but that's only one more. If Tavares stays beyond that, he's going to have to obviously take a lot less money. We know that. But they could be in a situation, even though the cap has gone up, that even with Tavares' contract expiring, that they could have just as much money tied up in three guys as instead of four. Because all that extra money could be spread out between all the raises we've seen over Matthews, Nylander and now Marner coming up and as much as they probably likely all have a desire and a goal to get it done and for Marner to be a Leaf it's going to be really tricky to see how this goes I mean at the end of the day I think that they're not in a hurry to do this as Merrick said they're not going to start negotiating now they're going to put this off to the summer he is eligible to sign July 1st there's no huge rush Matthews wasn't in a huge rush they got it done before the season started or whatever like you know it drug on for a while but wasn't like you know a huge concern. Nobody was really overly worried about it. And here we are. It got done. Could Marner be the same? It absolutely could. But at the same time, you know that the playoffs performance is going to be a huge, huge um, piece of the puzzle here. In Marner's case, Marner has struggled to score in the playoffs. He's gotten assists. He's been a playmaker. But we've seen long stretches of Marner struggling to put up goals in the playoffs. You know, if they get bounced in the first round this year after taking a step forward last year and then take a step back, is that going to give the team and Bradtree living cause for concern? Of do they want to bring back the same group? You know, with Marner's contract where it is, is that going to end up being him be a fall guy and could possibly end up getting moved to bring in other players? I mean, you take a look at Marner, he would have terrific value as being a high point producing playmaking winger. Like teams would pay a pretty penny to get him on their team. You know, so I think depending on how you look at it, his production in the playoffs, how the team does as a whole, and obviously not only that, but how this team responds on the physical tough side of the game. They have more elements in their roster now to, you know, handle that stuff. Marner and Matthews, though, they do need to play a harder style of game, too. I mean, they can't leave everything to Reeves and McCabe and Domi. And, like, you know, those guys are all going to be more physical. It's going to be, a 
theoretically should be a tougher team to play against if everybody does their jobs. But if Marner, Nylander, Matthews are still, if they're too easy to push around, it's still going to be challenging to have playoff success. So we'll see if this playoff formula will work for them or not. But at the end of the day, that performance is going to dictate a lot. And when you factor in, like I said, the fact that Marner needs a new contract, Matthews would love to have him continue to play on his wing for a long time. But are they going to be able to afford, you know, another, you know, $13, $14 million player? Because to me, Marner's demands are probably going to be just a little bit less than Matthews. That's always the way it's been. I don't see anything changing now, which is going to prove difficult. You know, as much as they want to keep them together, make Matthews happy, continue getting players to play with him who can get him to puck, can can this work? Or is this team going to end up having to make a bold move and get, you know, a bunch of other pieces that can make this team stronger in other areas? Let me know what your thoughts are. Is the Marner negotiation going to get done? Will he be a Leaf after that is signed? Or could we see a move in the offseason to drastically change the look of this franchise? Because, of course, by then we'll know how the playoffs went, whereas now we don't. So it's a tough question to answer. But let me know what you think down in the comments. We'll discuss further. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with all the news, rumors, and analysis of all 32 NHL teams. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time.